So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Also, I welcome all those who are joining through a webcast. Uh, warm welcome to the Q3 FY23 presentation and analysts uh, meet. Uh, today we have got uh, we have Dr. Anisha, MD and CEO, uh, Mr. Rajesh Yajurika, Executive Director, Auto and Farm, De Farm Sectors, Mr. Manoj Bhatt, Group CFO, uh, joining us for the call, uh, meet today, and also we have the entire uh, the senior leadership team of Auto and Farm joining us today uh, for the meet. Um, with this, I hand over the uh, in, in the, and over the podium to Dr. Anisha for his opening remarks and for the presentation. Thank you, Ram. And uh, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here with us uh, in person again after many quarters of these online meetings. So I'm glad we're starting to get back to normal. As you will see, We've had uh, an excellent quarter once again. Um, key messages, strong operating performance at the standalone level. Quarter three is up 52% before EI, which is more operational. Year to rate is up 47%. At the consolidated level, continued strong performance there as well. Q3 up 35%. Year to rate up 76%. The gap will narrow a bit. This is driven by Mahindra Finance. As you know, last year, Mahindra Finance had 2,500 crores of provisions in the first quarter. All of it came back in the next three quarters. So comparisons for the first quarter this year looked excellent. For the next three quarters, they will look a little weaker. So year to date is the number we look at. And we will expect a fourth quarter co comparison that will be lower than last year. So you will see that 76% probably come down a bit. And finally, we made a number of commitments, and we will give an update on that. But uh, happy to say that we've delivered on all the commitments that uh, we made so far. So on a standalone basis, revenue up 41% uh, for the quarter, 54% year to date. Uh, we talked about uh, bad before EI. Auto and farm are both driving this very strong performance at the standalone level. As we look at consolidated, uh, Mahindra Finance actually has come in with strong results. Um, and that has helped increase uh, the gains at the console level beyond what auto and farm has contributed. Uh, so there, as we see, both in terms of PAT before EI and after EI, strong numbers. There are some numbers here after EI that we will be relooking at our accounting policy. So for example, in what we've done consistently is gains in our growth gems are counted as EI. So sustain uh, gain is 1,400 crores. That's counted as EI for us today. Uh, but that's really not EI because that's what we plan for. Uh, we want our growth gems to continue creating value. That's what we're investing for. So we will be looking at the accounting policy and then making the appropriate changes as we go forward on that front. So which is why you see a much greater number uh, sort of post-EI there versus before EI. Our commitments, you've seen this slide before, at least on the left-hand side. The right-hand side is a, an update in terms of where we are, have been. We had started with the path to ROE at 18%. Uh, happy to say that year to date this year we are at 20.3%. Second, on EPS growth, we talked about a 15 to 20% EPS growth. And as you look at the numbers here, F21 to F22 is up 263%. And on 22 to 23, actually, year to date is higher than the num number shown here. It, this compares sort of three quarters versus four quarters. Uh, but we've got a robust EPS growth uh, from a year to date basis this year as well. From a scale standpoint, we committed to driving scale in our core businesses as well as scaling up our growth gems. And you're seeing that across the businesses today. We talked about auto margins being up 300 basis points in the medium term. Uh, we've actually achieved that faster than we had expected when we said that a year ago. And Rajesh will talk about margins being up 320 basis points. We've delivered gains from the sustain deal. In addition to that, uh, we sold some Kandivali land which will help our life spaces businesses grow. And a logistics business has made a second acquisition in Rivigo and is positioning itself very well uh, to really take advantage of the potential for logistics in India. 
So, lots of activities with regard to our growth gems as well. And finally, we talk about leading ESG, something that's important for us. Uh, we've done a lot of things in this area and uh, happy to report the recognition that we've got the first and only Indian auto manufacturer to be in the Dow Jones Sustainable Index. Uh, and that's just one of the many global recognitions that we're getting now. Uh, but more important than the recognition is the work that we're doing to drive sustainability. With that, let me hand it over to Rajesh to talk about uh, the details on auto and power. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And like Anish said, we've had a good quarter walk you through it. I'm sure you've gone through a lot of the numbers. So I'm going to be quick on them. Uh, for the auto and farm together, this was the highest ever revenue, 42% growth in the quarter. Uh, highest ever PBIT of over 2,000 crores. Again, very huge, 64% uh, growth. Uh, for the farm, highest ever quarter three volumes, 14% growth. 1.6 uh, share point gain in the quarter. Cumulative uh, YTD is a 0.9 gain in tractor market share. Uh, the auto highest ever quarter three volumes, 176,000, 45% growth, and continue to be number one in SUVs by revenue market share, uh, with a gain of about 500 basis points uh, from last year quarter to 20.6%. Uh, three wheelers highest ever volumes again and a continued market leadership of 63.5% market share. So very strong uh, growth numbers, as you can see, both on revenue, volumes, and uh, profits. Uh, these are the uh, numbers that you've probably gone through earlier. You can see here the revenue went up 42% for the quarter standalone. Uh, the PBIT went up 64% with a very good split now between auto and farm. Uh, if you look back the previous quarter, you can see that it was really farm-led, but with auto turning around, you can now see auto and farm uh, both contributing around the same number. Uh, look at uh, consolidated, and I'll do this quickly, PBIT grew 62%, uh, and now I'm going into the farm equipment. We expect the industry to grow over 10%. We said a little over five last time. We wanted to watch. Uh, we've seen a very good three months. Uh, better than what we had expected. Uh, we were being cautious and conservative when we put out uh, saying it will be in the region of 5% upwards, but we didn't expect it to be ending up where it is uh, going right now. Uh, at this point of time, we feel comfortable that it will cross 10% growth for the year. Uh, many factors are enabling that. Uh, the two that we've seen change in the second half, one is an improved government spending in rural and agri, uh, we were watching for that, that we see as a key factor. Uh, that's enabled growth. Uh, the monsoon is not new. Uh, the terms of trade with farmers have improved quite significantly. Uh, especially we're seeing Monday prices of most crops, especially wheat, uh, being much higher than the MSPs. And that's enabling a much better return to farmers. The terms of trade are not back to the earlier levels. But they are much better than what we had anticipated. And uh, we're seeing that that is a key enabling factor. We often talk about tractor market volatility. Uh, when you look at, and we always suggest don't look at one year or quarter at a time. When you look at it here, it's 9.5% CAGR F22, F23. Uh, you know about our market shares, but here is uh, on the quarter we gained 1.6%. And YTD, it's a 0.9% uh, gain. We are at 41%. A uh, strong recovery on our market share over the last few quarters. Uh, some key uh, building blocks towards that. Uh, one key enabler has been the success of UO Tech Plus. Uh, it's a significantly upgraded tractor, launched at a very good price, uh, contributes 15% of the total volumes right now. Uh, so that's enabling a key enabler to growth. Uh, we've added 120 new dealer points, YTD. Uh, two key marketing campaigns have played out very well. And in 30 to 50 horsepower, which is, you know, 75, 80% of the market, uh, we've gained 1.7 share points. We've been talking about scaling up our farm machinery business. We believe there's a big upside here. Uh, we've spoken about how large the farm machinery market is globally compared to uh, the tractor market and how India actually follows. It's the reverse in India. Uh, we've seen a 45% YTD growth in our farm machines uh, already in this year. 
that is in spite of harvesters seeing a slow year this year. Uh, we expect that to start changing and we have a plan uh, to move to 10 times where we are going, where we're going to end up this year uh, by the year 2027. Multiple actions are in place, a new product pipeline, uh, move a lot of manufacturing in-house to a new plant in Pitampur in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, the rethinking our channel reach, channel access, uh, and how we're going to do that across different types of products. And of course, when I say global expansion here, it's exports from India. Uh, we've seen a good sequential improvement in uh, farm equipment margins. Uh, as you can see, it's moved up from 15.7 uh, to 16.6 over the last four quarters. Uh, with that, I'll move on to the automotive business. Uh, the chart on the left shows you domestic volume growth. Uh, the red graph is the SUVs and then you have the LCV less than three and a half tons. Both have seen very strong growth. That's enabled us to drive a revenue growth of 53% uh, last quarter to this quarter. Uh, this chart shows you market shares. You've heard a lot about the SUV market share, but we don't talk so much about our LCV less than three and a half ton market share. We've seen a significant growth. If you want to normalize that curve, it's a five share point uh, gain that we're seeing uh, from the levels at which you were. It is a competitive segment, and in this competitive segment, uh, we've seen a very robust uh, increase in our market shares here. A strong uh, booking pipeline in UEs continues. Uh, we, on 1st February, have an opening book, open booking of 266,000. Uh, as we are reinforcing to every stakeholder, it's while we feel very good about the response that we're getting to every new launch, uh, we do worry about the waiting time. It has come down somewhat, but it's not at a level at which either we are comfortable or our customers are comfortable. Uh, I'm just flagging this off because we think it's a very significant achievement uh, to get on a body on a frame product like Scorpio and a five-star end cap rating. Uh, we believe is a very significant achievement uh, by our product development teams. And uh, it does, as we're seeing, starting to influence brand choice. And uh, the overall endeavor that we made in the area of safety is playing out now in India as customers are becoming more conscious about safety ratings. Uh, we launched the Thar rear wheel drive uh, recently. It's done extremely well. Uh, we went in with a very aggressive, as one may call it, uh, price aimed to redefine the segment. Uh, the 9.99 likes was done with a view uh, to take on the subcompact segment of SUVs because, uh, you know, uh, this product can then get into mainstream, uh, and that's really what it's beginning to do. Uh, it's seen a very strong, robust booking uh, in the few weeks since we've launched it. Uh, the XUV 400 started off very well as well. We opened bookings on 26th of January. We've got to 15,000 bookings in 13 days. Uh, we had put out in the original press release that we will aim to do about 20,000 in the course of the first year. Uh, so we are, at this point of time, happy uh, with the response of 15,000 uh, bookings. We will, as some of you know, deliver the first uh, auctioned uh, 400 later this evening. Uh, and those of you who are in the room, I will be there, I hope, to witness it. Uh, we have spoken about the trucks and buses portfolio, and I just want to reinforce that uh, you know we have a very strong product portfolio. We've created a new uh, platform in the ICV segment. We are seeing a very good traction in retails over the last few quarters, and uh, we will see ourselves uh, building on this uh, further. We've, uh, as you would have heard and read by now, uh, taken a readjustment of the value of the assets of this business, uh, and we believe that will set us up well for the future as well. Uh, quickly, the auto financials, 196% uh, growth over last year in auto profits to 990. And uh, what we had said, medium term, in at least in my vocabulary, was not four quarters, but uh, uh, we've been able to deliver that uh, sooner than we thought we would. And we are happy with that. Manoj asked the question, which I'm sure you will ask, what's next? Uh, not today. I've been able to convince Manoj that I'm not giving out <laughs> new targets so soon. 
So, uh, but you can see we have all the key enablers in place. Uh, a lot of work we're doing on uh, efficiencies, costs, and all of that is playing out in uh, improving our margins to what clearly is the best in class margin. Uh, to summarize, it's the highest ever revenue, highest ever PBIT, uh, sequential improvement in farm margins, uh, the 320 basis point margin improvement in auto in over the previous year, uh, strong improvement in tract ma market share, uh, auto SUV leadership continues, and a very strong momentum on three wheelers electric. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Manoj. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, so, first of all, welcome. And uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you are wait, uh, staying back for the event, so we'll find some time to interact. But uh, I think many of the key points have been covered by Anish and uh, Rajesh. So, if you look at the numbers, clearly uh, auto is driving the growth. From an EBITDA perspective, we are at 13% OPM. Uh, during the quarter, and that's an improvement of 160 bips. Uh, again, uh, both, I think, while auto is a standout performer, but even farm has had a very, very healthy quarter. I think that's one thing. In all the highest ever's, I think we are missing the strong performance of the farm segment. Uh, the other point on the EI element, I think we covered uh, briefly. So during the quarter, we looked at uh, the MTBD business. It was always a category C item where we had to evaluate. So we completed that evaluation and looked at the uh, future valuation of the business and compared it with the carrying value. So we've taken a hit in the financials, uh, which is uh, to the tune uh, before tax is about 680 odd crores. Uh, and uh, there's a tax benefit on that. So what we have done for this representation is kind of equated it out, while in the numbers you might see something slightly different, because that tax benefit is also coming on account of the CI. I think the other thing to say is there are some compensating entries, so the net impact is lower, which you see here. Uh, from a consolidated perspective, uh, two things to highlight here. So one is, uh, uh, I think Mahindra Finance uh, had a very strong Q3 last year. Uh, because if you go back, I think Q1 was a big provision. And then we had strong reversals come through the year. And we had committed that those reversals will happen in that year. And we actually did better than what we committed. So, so that is obviously that kind of reversal cannot be a normal situation. So we are seeing some impact of that on the group companies on, from a profit perspective. From a revenue perspective, I think it's a very steady growth in the group companies. Uh, I think the on, on this one, the only item I would like to point out additionally is uh, I think the exceptional item on account of the sustain transaction and uh, the accounting treatment is there's a gain on the sale plus a revaluation of our stake. So that's flowing through the numbers. So if you think of it, there's a positive on account of sustain and there's a negative on account of the Mahindra Trucks and Buses division. So if you look at the number, it is a 35% growth. But that includes that benefit coming through from a sustained perspective. A quick one on the group companies. So one is uh, Tech Mahindra. I think from a revenue perspective, a 20% growth. Uh, deal signings have been fairly steady at around 700 million. Uh, I think the key focus here is on margins. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, clearly uh, the manpower cost increases and inflation has uh, impacted the cost structure. And the pass back to customers is going to probably take a longer time. And that's something which uh, there's a lot of focus on. Uh, if you look at Mahindra Finance, a very healthy disbursement growth. Uh, and your GNP is coming down to 5.9%. So pretty much, I think, the focus on collections as well as the focus on growing the business continues. And uh, the PAT is down, as I mentioned uh, earlier. From a growth gems perspective, three listed entities. Uh, if you look at logistics, I think the uh, revenue is up 17%, uh, largely driven by the strength of the auto sector. Uh, we had the Revigo acquisition, as Anish mentioned. I think the focus there is integrating that acquisition and making it uh, profitable. Because while we bought it, I think it was uh, obviously an asset which was not profitable. And that's something we are turning around. 
as we go along. Uh, from a hospitality perspective, very strong occupancy numbers in India. Uh, and uh, I think the customer additions have also come back to the pre-COVID levels. Uh, the one thing there is uh, because they had a forex impact, so that's why you see a loss number there. And I think there's one more impact I'll talk about from a forex perspective in our numbers. And from a real estate perspective, the, uh, the company continues to do very well. From a residential launches as well as residential sales as well as the institutional sales, I think all three segments continue to do well. Uh, I think that's something which will reflect in the numbers in the uh, quarters going by and years going by. But uh, this quarter, uh, there was an exceptional gain uh, which, which has impacted profits quite, uh, positively. And it's after that, we are showing a 33% gain. So in summary, I think if you look at the waterfall, I think two or three things. One is auto and farm is a big positive. Uh, Techem and Mahindra Finance, I think the bulk of this top, about 156 odd crores is coming from Mahindra Finance. Uh, I think I spoke a bit about the growth gems. Uh, on the investment side, it's largely Forex led again because we have a Forex exposure in one of our subsidiaries, a uh, 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 forex loan exposure. So that's been marked. So that's where you see that negative. And then the EI swing, which I explained. So that's the uh, kind of build up from 1987 to 2677. Uh, with that, I think we have a small video to show you. So can we have the AV, please? but you're going to be making. I want to know you're making a better world. I'll give my money to the one who never robs the earth. I'll spend my fortune on you if you promise to think of the less fortunate too. I want to know you're making a more equal world. On investing your technology to put a man on Mars. But wait, why can't it be a woman? I'll click on your app, I'll walk into your shop. As long as you're fair to the farmer and his crop. I'm gonna be buying what you're gonna be making. And if you make the world a little better too, no one will feel richer than you. With that, we open it up for questions. Yes, couple, go ahead. And Gunjan, after that. Uh, thank you, uh, and congratulations on achieving most of the targets that we set out. Uh, my first question is to Rajesh. Uh, if I look at the SUV order book, um, you know, we are getting roughly about 50,000 a month kind of order inflow and uh, the wholesales have been closer to 30,000, 30 to 35,000 a month. Uh, we've also had the launch of 400 and uh, the area wheel thar. So uh, I would have expected the order book to increase a bit more, right? So just wanted some color on that from the point of view that we are going to 39,000 a month capacity and then 49,000 a month. So how you are thinking about that? Um, yeah, so Kapil, uh multiple ways to try and explain that. One is uh, we have improved the deliveries a lot in the quart current quarter. So, you know, you do, as you deliver, you are going to, and that's the benefit that we want, and which is why we keep saying we do want to bring down the order book. Uh, this kind of an order book is not good for market, is not good for customers, not good for anybody. I mean, you know, let's, let, it's nice to say we have 260, thousand plus orders, but that's not our desire. And, you know, I just want to put it out here today. We will be happy if we can come next quarter and tell you we brought the order book down. Uh, there will be many customers who want to buy, who don't want to 
book a product now and say, okay, I'm going to wait 12 months or 15 months or whatever at that time. So if we want to get demand momentum, it's going to happen as we bring the order book down. So firstly, I won't think about, you know, the order book size going down as a cause of worry. I would see it as a sign of positivity, which means uh, hopefully we are doing better with way of deliveries, retail, and uh, so on. So, you know, if you say two quarters down the line, we should be at 260,000, I, I would not be happy with that situation. We have to bring the order book down. This is not a good situation to be in. I mean, if you're saying we have 260,000 orders for a monthly sale of 35,000, what is that? I mean, it's not, not a good situation where there's 30,000 or 40,000 or 45,000. So we have to bring the order book down. Uh, and customers who are expecting that we're going to do that, right? There are many customers who come in and say, no, this is not tenable anymore. Uh, you know, if you tell us it's going to take eight months, ten months, whatever. So, so I, I, I'm not too worried about that. We still see a very strong momentum. Uh, a lot of the order book uh, does get consumed as we are delivering, and we've delivered pretty well in the coming quarter. Uh, so, so I wouldn't worry about that. You're right if you do a very mathematical calculation. Of course, we've launched two new products, so there've been some orders. Uh, so, you know, some there's been some adjustment downward of fulfilling orders of existing products. Uh, while we've created some orders of new products. But that's also a cycle, right? So every time you bring in something new that creates excitement, that will en enlarge the order book. But really for products which are there, we really have to bring the order book down and bring bring down waiting period. I think we br brought down waiting period by a month and a half or so right now, but that's not good enough. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, also Does that answer your question, Kapil, or? Uh, to to some extent, but yeah, I mean, the math uh, is uh, still something. Basically, what I'm trying to understand, is there uh, uh, also a cancellation factor yeah, here? Yeah, there is a there is a cancellation, as we've said, between bit, from product to product, between 5 to 7 percent. I mean, that's the number that we've been talking about, and that number, by and large, holds out. Okay. We've said that earlier, too, and yeah. that, that holds out. In some products, it may be 8, 10 percent, but on an average, we would say it's 7 to 8 percent cancellation. Sure. Uh, and second, uh, also wanted to know that uh, now we are selling almost twice of what we were selling pre-COVID, right? So how you are – and the uh, customers that we are having now are probably more premium customers as well, right? So how you are uh, preparing the network for, um, for higher volumes and more premium customers? Uh, and possibly this number will increase another 30, 40 percent if I look at the capacity plans, right? So just some color on both these aspects. And to your question, I would add a question on how are we preparing our network for selling electric, which, yeah. you know, we're realizing needs a very different selling scale because you're selling categories. I mean, you know, we've, we've been observing, I've been myself in some showrooms through the 400 process. Uh, the kind of questions customers are asking while they're making a decision on EV, uh, we do have to be much better prepared uh, by way of, our dealerships being able to handle uh, those questions, you know, what happens to battery, end of life, uh, you know, the multiple things that customers want to know, repairability, so on and so forth. So, you know, I'm just adding to your question to say yes, uh, as our customers get more premium, um, I, the, I think the volume part I'm not so uh, concerned about, you know, dealers when they see volume and they see money, then uh, they figure, most of our dealers figure ways to bring capital in. So I, I'm not really worried about the volume increase. Uh, we've also expanded our network in all the metros where a lot of the growth has come in from. Uh, so I, I think from a ability to handle volume point of view, we've filled in all the gaps, especially in metros, we've expanded network. Uh, the critical task ahead of us is really the skill upgradation and uh, how well we are able to play out story, the sales story or the experience story for, especially our category of customers are extremely passionate. There's a lot we are doing around it, but uh, if I think we have a long way to go as well. Okay. Um, any any more details you can give, like what exactly you are doing, and also on network, any numbers you have, uh, how much it is, how much we want to expand. Vijay, you want to take it? I think one important thing I would just want to say is that, uh, you know, as we are expanding uh, the channel, we are very, very mindful and conscious that we don't want to over-invest the dealers in large infrastructure. Because the whole 
purchase model and the consumer journey is very fluid and it's changing and we believe in the electric era it will change even more. So what we've done is we've actually created a concept what we call the cube. And last year or YTD we have done about 130 cubes uh, across the country and the whole idea is uh, I'll come to the rural but on the urban side we've done about 130 cubes where high traffic uh, locations we set up 800 to 1200 square foot location, one maximum two vehicle park in parking, couple of test drive vehicles, high on digital for customer engagement. And that's worked very, very well because the ROI, or let's say the ROC from a dealer perspective, um, it's, 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 uh, it's very, very good on business case. As far as rural is concerned, uh, we've, uh, we've opened about uh, 220 touch points uh, across the country doesn't sound like a very large number, but uh, looking at penetration for now, I think 220 is the kind of number we were gunning for. We'll probably get to about 350 by the end of the year. Did you want to talk anything on skill upgradation, the boot camps that we do? and? Yeah, so, okay. Uh, with every launch now... Just on customer experience, you know. Yeah, so, you know, the whole idea of Cube is a very different customer experience. You typically would not... So, for example, we've done a lot uh, by using Salesforce as a platform on which uh, we are creating the omni-channel journey so that when the customer kind of walks into these places, the consultant already has a lot of information about the customer in the sense which model, which variant, what has been the contact with the call center, what has been the last conversation of the consultant with the customer. This A lot of, a lot of it is in place. Some of it is still WIP. Uh, that's the whole approach towards consumer journey. Now, that's one side, uh, you know, of building capability. That is, how do we get our consultants to be more friendly in terms of interacting with the customer from information available? Second is, when the customers walk in these days, the kind of questions they ask is absolutely different. Nobody wants to know power, talk, dimension. That homework's already done. Comparisons are already done. So they come in with very particular questions. So what we've done this time around with the last three launches is we actually do what we call a boot camp, which is live with the product. So we get sales consultants from our dealerships to a mother location, which let's say is Chakan for some of our previous launches, or it could be Nasik. And we get them to stay there for like a week, 10 days. They immerse in the product. We bring in subject matter experts on technology because all our vehicles, these are very high on technology. So that's, uh, again, a different way in which we are building capability. A lot of that we've done with 4 double as Rajesh also alluded to, that consumers want to know about battery. They want to know, I mean, there was a very interesting question one customer asked in the showroom. When you try and explain this is an electric vehicle, so the customer said, is this a toy car? Yeah, now, who could it. imagine a customer it's walking into a showroom and asking a question like this, right? So I think there's a lot we are learning and there's a lot that we are doing in terms of the way in which we are building our capability. Vijay, want to add? A uh, couple just to add to that. Technology is going to change the game. And Vijay, if you can just talk about metaverse and how we are using that. Yeah. And you may not need dealers to do everything in this case. So go ahead. Uh, so, so far what we've done on the metaverse is just uh, building blocks. Right now the website is on the whole 400 experience is a metaverse experience, which is on two dimensions on a screen in front of you, on your laptop phone. What we are now moving to is an immersive experience at two levels. One is when the consumer will walk in through a VR gear, we'll give a very, very different experience, including a test drive. They're looking at simulators as an option, and even hologram holography as an opportunity going forward in terms of the immersive experience we will give. So we are really leveraging on all the new age technologies in terms of the immersive experience we'll be able to give customers, including test drives. Thank you. Couple, uh, we gave a very long answer, but yeah, sorry about that. We normally don't get questions. I like that. We normally don't get questions like this. Well, so we're actually, happy I'm, when I'm, we get yeah, questions like this. I'm glad that you know this is a non-financial question. Yeah. Gunjan, Gunjan, I think. You taking my questions. I uh, Just keeping the discussion on the uh, UVs, 
Um, there is a lot of chat around the regulations, right? There are two RDE as well as CAFE. And I know RDE, you all had spoken about 9,000 to 15,000 sort of increase. So maybe, you know, just a refresh on that. Is the number still the same as we're getting closer to the deadline? And also, are there any models which could entail a higher cost increase? Because some of the products didn't go through a, a launch recently. So maybe RD and uh, also on CAFE norms, again, where we stand in terms of the target uh, CO2 emission. And, uh, you know, does it mean we should be worrying about any penalties for F23? Yeah, so uh, we're by and large on that target cost. There are some models which will go up to 20, 20 2000. That's the range. Uh, so by and large in the region of the cost that we told you. And uh, on CAFE, we've done a lot on our ICE portfolio to be optimized, and uh, we don't see any penalty at this point of time coming out of CAFE with the launch of the 400, which will bridge, if, uh, bridge any gap that may be needed. So, so, so we are we are comfortable in all scenarios, including the XUV 400 deliveries that you will do in in Feb and March. That's part of it. So I'm just saying, with whatever that's planned to be sold now, of XUV 400 between Feb and March, we are confident that in any scenario of regulation that the government may have, or any scenario of penalty which they have not been able to finalize, we'll be okay. Okay, got it. Just shifting the discussion to tractors now. Uh, you know, looking at the margins uh, for this quarter. Uh, it, you know, this was clearly a good quarter from an operating leverage perspective. We did see steel benefit also flowing through, but the margin expansion isn't as as meaningful. So, just wondering, you know, directionally, is it because you know uh, you we don't want to take significant price increases? So, you know, we sh we will relook the range uh, from a mid, you know from a next 12, 18 months perspective. Not, uh, I mean, how should we think about the margins there? Um, and uh, also from an outlook perspective, um, you know, you yourself mentioned 9% CAGR, and this tends to be cyclical industry. So, how, you know, F24, does it mean from a demanding base, uh, you know, we could see industry sort of plateauing out? And there's also El Nino risk, which, you know, which potentially can be a risk to monsoons as well. So some color on the uh, tractor business. Yeah, so I'll take that as two questions. One is tractor margin and how does one read that and interpret that? Uh, the second is around next year. Second one is easier to answer because I'm not going to answer it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we, we it typically it's a little early to uh, put out a tractor forecast for the next year. Uh, we also wait to see what happens in the last few months, and then we wait to see what's the latest um, that's coming out on the monsoon forecast. You know, so we've seen four years of normal monsoon, which has never happened before. So. You've got to factor all of that in. Uh, so, so we'll wait a little bit to see where this year ends up uh, before deciding what's going to happen next year. But in respect of the growth of next year, I think what we have to keep in mind is 900 plus thousand is a very robust industry size, and uh, there's there's hence uh, you know a lot that it's 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 not a small size. So you may on that size of industry see one or two years of low growth, and that's part of the cyclicity. So we just need to factor that in mind. Um, on the first question on tractor margins, um, we've passed on all the material cost now. right? Uh, and as we've been saying in the past, uh, the impact of not passing on the margin on material cost has a big impact on margins as a percentage. Uh, but we've passed on all the material costs that have happened through the commodity cycle. Uh, the reductions that are happening in commodity prices is having a decimal impact on margin right now. Uh, that's not large enough to offset the very big impact of margin not passed on on material cost over a, almost a two-year period. Right? So it's like I think in the order of magnitude of 80,000, uh, we've taken price increases of 80,000 rupees uh, in two years. So it's, it's a lot. And when you're taking that kind of an increase uh, in material cost and not passing the margin uh, in a high margin business, it, it, it has like, uh, I think, a four odd percent impact just not passing on the margin. So if you had passed on margin on the material cost increase, our margin would have been higher by four odd percent. That's roughly our guesstimate. So that's really the gap that you have to keep in mind. Right? So when we are saying we are in the region of 16.5, 17, if you are didn't have the effect of margin not passed on, that would have been 20 plus. So, so which is why you're seeing a robust profit impact, 
but it doesn't show as a percentage margin right now. Uh, I don't think that percentage margin will easily come back to that level till we see a significant decline in commodity because that's when you are not dropping prices as fast as the commodity prices are dropping, right? So just as you see a lag when the commodity price is going up that you're not able to pass on as quickly, uh, here you don't pass off as quickly as the commodity price is dropping. So that's when you start getting the benefit of the margin. So I think we'll have to wait a little bit to be able to recover the margin not passed on. But from a material cost, we've passed on everything now. And bulk of the reset in these steel contracts is already reflected in this, this quarter. So there's no tailwind that necessarily flows through in quarter four from steel easing that we saw. Sorry, from what part? I'm no. Bulk of the steel easing is already reflected in this quarter. There's no tailwind that we should expect going into quarter four, right? That yeah. reset is already reflected. Yeah. Yeah, hi, this is Hitesh from CLSA. Um, so my question is just uh, continue on this discussion tractors. Actually, uh, first is on the trim for norms. We have seen a substantial price increase which has happened on the 50 HP plus tractors because of the trim for norms, uh, you know, getting implemented on the 50 HP plus tractors. Your competitor is talking about that the norms for the less than 50 HP will get uh, postponed to, F, uh, uh, you know, FY25. So any, uh, you know, uh, color you can give us on that, over how the government is thinking on that? Himant, do you want to comment? Himant is also the president of TMA, so maybe you want to just wear that hat, Himant. So the TRAM5 currently applies to only 50 HP and above tractor. That has got implemented from 1st of January, and we have made the switch uh, coming to tractors which are between 50 and 25 HP, which will form bulk of the industry, and that uh, was to happen 12 months from now, most likely uh, uh, it would get delayed because there has not been any instance where when the TRAM4 has got so much delayed, the TRAM5 cannot hold its timeline. We need a minimum uh, changeover period of uh, four years. Uh, so TMA is talking to the ministry, uh, and we have put up our case. And right now it is an active discussion. Mostly in our discussion, we have found them uh, to be hearing, uh, listening to our concerns, but right now no decision has been taken. So we, uh, as TMA, we are in continuous engagement with the government to see that they follow the norms, what globally everybody has followed, which is usually a four to five year time period between one tram to another tram. That's all it is going to be. So if you ask me my personal view, even FY25 seems to be very early. I just also had a question on the tractor margins, if Manoj can give us more granularity. Uh, basically, I think steel contracts have got revised quite substantially, and we've seen that in commercial vehicles, you know, margins, and uh, but I think it's happening more at the panel and not at the component level. So when do we see that uh, uh, coming down in the component level? Because at some point in time, steel should come, prices should come down there as well, right? So what is happening exactly, if you can... So, Hitesh, I, I don't think I'll add much to what has been said. But uh, from our perspective, I think the reasons are known. Uh, I think the commodity price cycle we are watching closely because uh, China opening up, like it or not, is going to be a factor across the board. So, and you you also know that there's a lag effect. So, I think uh, while it's our endeavor to be operating at the highest margins possible, and which we are trying to do, but uh, I think some of these conditions I will refrain from kind of giving a view on where the margins will head. Uh, having said that, I, as we have demonstrated in the past, I think the goal is to improve margins. Uh, and that's how, and there will be certain pulls and pressures sometimes for short term. And as we said last time, 300 BIPs four quarters back, I think we have reached the numbers earlier than we thought. Uh, and that's something which we'll continue. But I, I don't want to go into the specifics of which quarter what will happen. So I think on the commercial vehicle, you're seeing a much greater operating leverage kick in compared to tractors. So I don't think it's comparable uh, right now because commercial vehicles have gone through a huge industry down cycles. So you're seeing, and that's an industry driven with very high operating leverage like tractors. Right? So when you, when you see a big volume upswing, you'll suddenly see margins go up. So that's what's happening in the CV market. That's not comparable to tractors right now because 10-12% uh, growth is not giving 
that kind of operating leverage that you're seeing in CV. So I really don't think you should compare what's happening to CV margin connecting that with steel contracts. I think it's just, op my sense is it's more operating leverage right now. Uh, hi, this is uh, Amin from JP Morgan. Uh, two questions from my side. First question is actually on the uh, light commercial vehicles. We are seeing that in the sub two ton category, the volumes have already started to show some uh, weakness. Whereas the two to three and a half ton where you are more dominant is still strong. So my question was that, do you think that this weakness in the lower category is just a precursor of some issues in demand or is it specific to that category and you don't see you know, uh, this playing out in the whole, uh, whole segment? Uh, I, I think that's a fair observation, uh, something we're watching closely. Uh, you know, there are, there are segments in the economy that are going to be more price driv sensitive driven and the less than two ton uh, LCV, I would put it in that category as the same as small size passenger vehicles. So these are segments which are seeing, uh, you know, pressure, inflationary pressure, so on and so forth. I think it's too early to say that that's a stress point, but that's something that we would watch closely for. I think anything, any segment right now which is extremely price sensitive, we will watch for. Fortunately, on the SUV side, we are not in that space too much, but the LCV less than two ton could be in that space. We're not seeing that in last mile mobility electric. So, you know, that's the, that's the dichotomy because there we're seeing very good momentum, maybe because cost of ownership, uh, e-commerce growth, all of that is enabling that, whereas the less than two ton uh, LCV segment doesn't have that much e-commerce momentum. So, you know, maybe that's one differentiating factor that's more dependent on stands and fleet of uh, open market, uh, you know, stand operators as they're called. So, uh, but it's something I, I think it's a fair point and something to watch closely for. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, second question for Anish. So, you know, uh, we have met or surpassed most of the medium term group targets that you were talking about. I think even Mahindra Finance is now at 16% ROE, which I think among the large listed names was in the B category, maybe going towards A. So as we look to the next one to two years, will it be more about consolidation or do you think it's time to up the targets? Time to up the targets. <laughs> okay. Any, any numbers you would like to share right now or? Uh, Okay, let, let me mm. give you a little mm. more thoughts on that. I'm not going to give you numbers right now, but I'll give you thoughts on it at least. Um, you're right, we've made commitments, delivered. I'm hoping it's more than most, but uh, close to almost everything we've said. We've talked about the four large businesses, and we said they need to be on track and grow at a very significant pace and generate um, high growth from specific opportunities there. So farm machinery, you saw, was a specific opportunity generating high growth. In auto, uh, breaking out last mile mobility is a significant uh, growth area for us. And uh, you will see that as we go forward as well as to the level of aggressiveness that we have there. And, and we really want to be number one in that space despite big competitors and, and we will find ways to get there. Um, beyond that, EVs growth area and in general auto product has, has taken it to a great level. Mind the finance, you're right, is I would say halfway through the turn turnaround right now not completely there. We've talked about a two-year turnaround plan. We've gone through the first year, and uh, we've talked about asset quality. Asset quality today, stage three, is less than 6%, 5.9%. Uh, net NPS, 2.5%. We want to be able to demonstrate that in any economic downturn, stage three will not go more than 8%. Now, that number may change slightly based on what we are, our final analysis shows, but the set of actions that we've talked about there will enable that to happen. It's about uh, changes in some policies, changes in uh, bringing in diversification in products, going after the rural affluent. So you're getting products where you have a much lower inherent NPA, uh, which we didn't have because if you look at our GNPAs and compare them with any of the NBFCs or banks in that segment we play in, we are better than them. And we've been better even in the downturn. But the problem is we were only in that segment. So we showed a 16% GNPA uh, during a downturn. Whereas others had enough things to buffer them, which we did not. So that was one part of it. The second part was technology and data. A uh, lot of work and progress done on that. The third was uh, really bringing in a very strong team. And that's something that we have done. Uh, there is not just the new CEO that we've announced, but the 
next level of leadership team also has come in from various large banks in the country and, and technology houses and so on. So that entire turnaround is on track. You're seeing the results. You will continue to see more results there. TechM, we need to do a little more. Uh, there's still a lot more to be done on margins in TechM. Uh, that will, you will start seeing more of that, but we are sort of a little behind on TechM as compared to Mahindra Finance. So these are the four large plays. Growth gems we've talked about, we are on track there, and we're seeing good progress across the growth gems. The next thing we're going to look at is uh, something much bigger. And it's going to be in an area where we can truly add value. We're going to be very selective about where we go there. It may be in a related industry out of what we do right now. Uh, it may be taking one of our businesses and scaling it up much further. Uh, so we're starting to think about that because we've generated a lot of cash from our investments, as we call it, from group companies. We are staying firm with saying auto and farm cash will not be used for investments. You said that before. We're saying that again, and we will, we will stay with that. Uh, if we have excess auto and farm cash, we will give it back to investors. But where we've generated a lot of cash from investments, we feel we can put that in, and where we can grow much faster than market, we will. So that is our philosophy. As we have more numbers on that, we'll come up with it, but we're upping the game. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, this is... Sorry, can I go ahead? Yo. Okay. Hi, this is Yogesh from HSBC. Uh, Anish just wanted to uh, follow up on your comment on Tech Mahindra. Uh, this is uh, your largest uh, associate and most contributing to SOTP from our perspective. Uh, the company has performed below par for few years now, and while it makes 20% ROE, which is your threshold, uh, the board seems to be very tolerant uh, in the last few years. So I wanted to just wondering, is there a thought process to do some restructuring, or are you happy with 20% ROE? Because within the sector, that's the lowest ROE now, and uh, it's been quite volatile last few years. Thanks. So tolerant is not a word we are using too much, as you will see. Uh, there is room for growth. Let me also highlight some of the losses that Tech Mahindra has achieved uh, in terms of new account wins for large accounts is actually done very well. And as you, you would compare it with its larger peers as well, it actually has done much better on that count depending on how you see it. Uh, it has been able to penetrate new segments where telecom had been the mainstay in the past. Uh, financial services, healthcare, there are many large accounts who've come in and seen the value that Techem has to offer there. It continues to be one of the leaders from a customer standpoint with regard to being able to solve customer problems and be flexible and nimble and agile in doing that. So there are many pluses there. Uh, there are areas where there is scope for improvement. And I won't go into detail right now. I will leave that to a sort of tech uh, analyst meet for that. Uh, but there are areas of improvement there, and I think some of them have been mentioned in, those, in, in that call as well. Um, and the net result has to be a higher margin and therefore a higher ROE. The answer is, are we happy with the 20% ROE and the current margin? No, we're not. Uh, what is a plan to get there? Um, we will talk more about it as we go on. We are in the middle of a uh, CEO succession plan as well. And uh, that's something that we want to make sure that that is completed first before we go out with a detailed sort of plan. And that may also be a one or two year turnaround, similar to what we've done with Mindra Finance. All I can say about the succession is, it's being done in a very structured, very thoughtful manner. The board is leading that, and we will make sure that it is done very smoothly, as we've done when I came in, as we've done with Mahindra Finance. Uh, and we're ensuring that in Techem as well, we will have a very smooth succession as we go forward. So as that happens, we will come back with more on, on Techem. Fair enough. Thanks. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is a question to Rajesh. Uh, so this is with regard to the EV pricing or the competitive in intensity on the EV pricing. Uh, so definitely the competition is surprised by the price which you brought, and there is some pricing actions uh, taken in the marketplace. So I wanted to understand your thoughts in terms of pricing your product, considering you brought a superior battery technology. And isn't it much of a space available there to price your products uh, easily to uh, get the market share which you require? Or you feel it's still a very uh, nascent market and hence the aggression can still play out? 
I, I think the first part of your statement was a comment, so I'll just uh, take that as noted. And uh, the second part, I think, is the question, which is uh, how much room is there for growth? And what's the right price at which growth can come? I'm reading that as the question. Would that be about right? Yeah, the market size or the opportunity. Or is it very small that you need to fight on the pricing? You know, my, my experience with pricing is you know whether it's right or wrong only after it's done. Um, so it's before the event, you never know whether you got it right or not. It's only when you've done it that you realize that did you really mess it up or did you get it right? Our inclination is to make sure we get it right, and then there's enough room to recoup as you go along, even if you underpriced it. Um, in the in the EV story, you know, as we've spoken about in the earlier conversation around customer experience and so on, uh, I right now don't think it's a pricing. Uh, pricing is the key factor here. It's more about selling the category and getting customers to understand the category benefit. Uh, and the barriers to change, including, you know, how do you get charging set up in your society? Will you get permission? Not, you know, the multiple sets of uh, questions people have. So I don't, my sense right now is that for the category of customers coming in with the penetration in the C segment, as we've said earlier, is like less than 1% C SUVs, and in the B is 2.5%. That's the electric category penetration right now. So there's enough headroom. But it's going to need uh, very good uh, overcoming of entry barriers from a customer standpoint. And really, that has to be the focus. Uh, the question is, could we have launched it at a slightly higher price? Maybe the answer is, yeah, it could have, and it wouldn't have made much of a difference. Uh, but as we had also announced that this entry price was for 5,000 plus 5,000, 10,000 numbers for the two variants. So uh, we would be moving to... Uh, uh, higher price point which we haven't announced yet. And uh, related to the EV business again, uh, since it's almost like uh, four or five months the born EVs have been displayed, uh, what's the progress in terms of uh, in terms of technology, what you want to bring there or the supply chain, uh, what you want to change with the uh, tires globally which you're trying to do there, that's one. Second, uh, looking at your own journey through the acquisition of EV products and now launching XUV400 and the Born EV, uh, where you are trying to experiment more outside world than the in-house capability being built. Uh, is there anything like a early more advantage in EV business, or it's, it's more about how quickly you learn and learn the ecosystem? Um, so the first part of the question is how are we progressing on what we announced? August last year in Banbury. Uh, so far, we are progressing well. We are on target dates, and you know, we'll put out a set of things that we need to get done by this time. We are on track. Actually, we're building one of the protos about now. Uh, so we're at a very, very good stage by way of progressing on the dates that we've put out. At this point of time, we don't see any risk to the timelines that we had put out for the three products that we had said will be the. If you remember, we had put out five products. We had said one was a concept, three have been kicked off, and one was WIP from a kickoff place. Three which we had kicked off are on schedule. Uh, there's some work happening on closing out on the one which, which was a BO7, and the BO9, which was a concept car. We are again at some advanced stage on what to do around that. So overall, we are directionally on the path, uh, you know, to. Uh, to meet the timelines that we had put out. Uh, we feel one of the great values of partnership in this space is not just around technology, but uh, vertically integrated supply chain. Because in the next four to five years, supply chain of EVs is going to be one of the key success factors uh, and the right costs. And that's where we feel we'll get the greatest value of the Volkswagen partnership because uh, they're investing a lot, and they have a fully integrated supply chain all the way down to the mine. So uh, we, we, that's the part that we feel comfortable with from a fortification standpoint. Um, there are multiple new technologies, as you rightly pointed out, that we had spoken about, and uh, uh, we are actually on track to creating a very, very good advanced uh, tech product. Uh, what will an early mover advantage really play a huge role? I don't think so. 
because uh, technology is evolving so quickly that if you've come in too early and locked into the wrong technology, you're going to, uh, that's not going to help, you know. So uh, it's, it's better at this stage for, you know, I think we've conceptualized our new portfolio at a time when we were able to take in most of the new technologies that are coming in and we've, we are really creating something future ready because we really believe the category explosion will happen around 2024, 20, 25. So we don't think early mover advantage is a really critical thing in this game. I, you had many questions. I hope I've covered most of them. I'll, I'll just add to the early mover advantage. In this industry, there is no advantage in that sense. I mean, even we'll come out with five new born electric products. We're very confident we will take leadership in there. But we will not be able to maintain that leadership if we don't keep coming up with a good set of products. Because this is just a power train. The consumer is going to look for design. It's going to look for other features in the car. It's going to look for um, pricing. All of those factors that come into play. If you look back at the history, at one point we had a 55% market share in SUVs. We lost that because we had others come in with much better products, etc. We had to change our game, come in with a much stronger set of products, and we've gained back a good amount of market share over the last two or three years, and we still have sort of some way to go on that. So it, we have to stay on our toes in this space. Uh, someone's going to come in with a better product or a better set of products, and eat your lunch if you're not ready for it. So we really don't see, you know, any scope for complacency or any advantage, not just at the early mover, but even at the next level. You've got to continually be able to do that. Okay, so there are a couple of questions from there. Online. Um, there's one question from Chandra Mouli Muttaya of Goldman Sachs. Um, the question is, your tractor peers have been calling out down trading and commodity cost pressures, but you seem to be managing these operational trends pretty well. Your tractor industry volume guidance also seems to be heading higher over the past couple of quarters. What are some of the things you are doing differently in this space? Would it have been possible, Sriram, to have asked this question earlier to some of the other questions on tractor margin? <laughs> Uh, I'm glad someone thinks we are managing tractor margin well. Uh, so thanks, Chandramali, for that. Uh, we have been taking aggressive price increases. The, I think what we have to keep in mind is that we've gained market share while doing that. Uh, you know, in, in, when you are at the kind of market share where we are, to gain a 0 0.9 YTD market share or 1.6 in the quarter is a is a pretty substantial uh, gain in market share. So. Uh, we always manage the trade-off between um, margins and market share, and that's the hardest part of the tractor game. Uh, it's very easy in our position to say, okay, let's just go and increase margins, but we know that that's a very dangerous game to play, and it's very easy to take 1 or 2% margin increase right now and then lose competitive advantage and go ahead and go declining market share. So that's not something we will do. Uh, neither will we throw money away to get, uh, you know, market share, uh, buy market share, but neither will we let the reverse happen. So neither will we change, chase margins blindly to, uh, in a way that we are going to erode our market share or our market position. Uh, so that's the trade-off I think Hemant and team have managed really well, which is uh, use products and technology. The, the UO tech is a great example. Uh, it was a derivative of the UO product, but brought costs down significantly by retaining what customers really valued. And now the premium of UO tech over our uh, traditional H1 platform, as we call it, is very affordable for customers to move up. And that's why we're seeing 15% of the volume come from there. Uh, with that, we've been able to bring in key, several key technologies to customers at a much more affordable price than what we were able to do with the UO that we had originally. Uh, so I think that's been one key, one key element, which is the delivery of the product strategy. Uh, there are many new things that Hemant and team are doing around introducing newer digital technologies, IOTs, and you'll hear more about that as we go along. So we would want to lead the product curve. Uh, in a manner of speaking, try and decommoditize the category uh, with through product differentiation. Uh, so Sriram, I think that would be, I think, one area I would kind of focus on seeing what we've done well. And we've taken price increases appropriately at the right time, apart from everything. Just one thing I'll add on tractor margin, uh, I think it came up, but I'll just emphasize it. We've talked before that farm machinery will have a negative impact on tractor margins. We've talked about farm machinery going 10x by 27. And 
we want to do that aggressively. We will accept low margins on farm machinery for the next five years. Uh, and as it grows, at the margin, it will have some impact on tractor margins. Uh, we will... PS margin. Uh, sorry, on, on farm margins, not tractor margins, sorry, on FES margins. Uh, and we will look at breaking it out soon as it becomes material enough so that you can start separating tractor margins versus farm machinery margins to look at overall FES margins. So what you see today is some negative impact coming from a growth in farm machinery as well. Okay, another question from uh, Chandra Moli was in terms of Scorpio number falling from 130K to 119K. That's a backlog. Is it only because of the production um, backlogs or um, production issues or any other factors involved? I, I think we spoke about that earlier, and yes, that there has been a 10% cancellation on that, and um, and some of the cancellation has been on models, which we, you know, in the, in the case, unlike XUV700, just to clarify this, uh, the learning out of XUV700 is we got a very high percentage of high end, which was completely what we were not prepared for. Uh, so in Scorpio N, we basically said let's prioritize the Z8, uh, which is the Z8L, right? We call it the Z8L, which is the highest version of Scorpio N first. So we actually only produced that for the first uh, two and a half, three months. Uh, so we've cleared a lot of that waiting period because we just produced the high end. Uh, in the process of that, what's happened is the people who booked some of the lower end versions, then their wait time has gone up beyond the comfort zone. Uh, so we have had some cancellations around around that. Uh, but as soon as we start the production of that, which will be around now, towards the end of Feb, we'd expect that momentum to come back. Uh, also, you have to keep in mind that we have a very strong demand for Scorpio Classic, way beyond what we were selling earlier. Uh, and that product is just going through the roof at the moment. Okay. And there's one question from Kishore of Cholamandalam Finance, Cholamandalam MS. Uh, the question is, the company has provided for rupees 628 crores as impairment for certain long-term investment in Q3. And in Q2, this was 248 crores. And I think it's calculated the last seven quarters. It's about 1126 crore or 11% of the last seven quarter pat. So is, when, is, when is this provision for impairment will stop? Uh, answer to that is very soon. And a longer answer to that is we have been open about where it's coming from, which is all the category C companies. Uh, PMTC, glad to announce that the transaction is closed. Last time we talked about it being signed, 31st March it was closed, so PMTC is out. Uh, that is an impairment that uh, will come as of 31st Jan, so you will see that in, in the Q4 numbers. Uh, that's the one factor that will come in. Trucks and buses was in uh, category C as well, and we talked about that uh, briefly. That Will, is what has resulted in the impairment in this quarter. Um, prior to that, everything else in Category C that we took care of was the future impairments. Uh, so the question is what's left now? Right? Uh, now we effectively have uh, Automobili Pininfarina left uh, as one that uh, we haven't got completely back on track. Uh, all the farm businesses, uh, the global businesses are actually doing very well, are on track. We've been reporting numbers, pro good profit numbers for them. Um, on the auto side, the ones that we had to take care of, we've taken care of. Outside the auto side, we've taken care of everything else. So I think it's APF. It may be something else small after that. But I mean, there's hardly anything left in Category C at this point in time. One clarification is APF. We we are not having any carrying value today. So so from a P and L impact, it's it's probably not going to be a material impact. I think from a business turnaround is what we are focused on. Just a Quick clarification on APF. One last question from online before no. going there. Okay, uh, this is from Janesh Gandhi of Motilal as well. Is there, yeah, is there any change in the SUV launch pipeline? There was some teaser from Mr. Bose on launch of CY23. So that's one question. I didn't understand. Can you clarify more? Another question is there any change in SUV launch pipeline? There was some teaser from uh, Pratap. On launch launch pipeline? Yep, SUV, new product launch. No. I, I have to check what Pratap has tweeted. But <laughs> okay. And uh, can you talk, 
can you talk about how many markets are you present with Trio? What are the plans to launch in key markets? And what is the plan to ramp up capacities in F24? How many markets I'm guessing within India, that's the question, right? Yeah. We've well represented, it's a well distributed product, all our key dealers have it. We have separate dealers as well for last mile mobility products, so it's reasonably well reasonably well distributed. Vijay, you would have a number, maybe like 400 dealers I think are selling it right now. 330 or whatever dealers, yeah. Uh, that we would maybe add another 100, 150 as we go along. Um, we see, like Anish said, you know, uh, the last mile mobility business is one where we see a huge opportunity for growth as we go forward. Uh, very proven cost of ownership benefit to customers there, and that's the reason we're seeing a very good penetration. Uh, so that's a business in which we are investing towards growth, creating new product pipeline, uh, some of you may have announced that we uh, read that we announced the MOU with Telangana government yesterday to uh, invest in a new expansion of our current Zahirabad plant there uh, to make uh, electric vehicles. So we are we are planning a good cycle of growth uh, there, and we see a lot of positives. And he said we are number one, but you know we we will do everything to stay a very strong number one in that category. And uh, just to add there, this is our newest addition to growth gems. It has a credible plan to get to a billion dollars market cap in the next three to five years. So that is a newest addition to growth gems. Uh, hi team, uh, Binay from uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, I know the uh, electric order book is quite small, but any insights into the consumer? Where is the consumer coming from? for this 15,000 uh, electric vehicle order book that we have. And similarly, if you go three years forward, we will have slew of electric vehicle models in our dealerships. Do you see the need to have a separate uh, sort of a distribution marketing channel? Because assumingly, this will be higher ASP points. There'll also be maybe some risk of cannibalization. So any comments on that? Uh, I'll, I'll answer the first question. Maybe Vijay can chip in a little bit if he wants to on the profile of the profile of the four double O customer. Right? Uh, and on the second question as well. So let me take the second question first. On the second question, I think I would say wait and watch. Uh, we haven't yet. You know, these are very hard to spinning of a channel is easier said than done. Uh, you add a lot of cost to the channel partners, as Vijay mentioned earlier. You know. The whole selling process two to three years later may be driven much more by technology than it is today. And, uh, you know, the whole paradigm of you need the big dealerships as it is we are moving to cubes. But, uh, you know, the whole buying may become much more digitally enabled, uh, especially for the EV kind of customer. So I wouldn't at this point of time jump and say that let's, you know, spin off the channel. Uh, we may create brand experience centers that we've said, you know, for EV specific. But we may not, at this point of time, we are not saying, thinking that we need to spin off uh, EV into a separate network for SUVs. Does not mean that we won't consider doing that, but I I think it's premature to think about it. So right now we're not working on the path of saying EV should sell out of a separate channel. Uh, for many of our customers, they would want to compare ICE and EV before deciding. And, uh, you know, every time we talk about our EV SUV numbers, we always say it's a percentage of our SUV portfolio. And uh, we are mentally prepared for cannibalization, hence it will be part of how we will sell. So uh, so at this point of time, at least I would think there's more value in keeping it together in the same channel than spinning it off and then, you know, customer goes to buy EV, doesn't like it, then has to go somewhere else to check out your ICE counterpart. I think you'll lose, we'll lose customer in the process. So at least my, the orientation we have right now is we should keep it together. Uh, that doesn't mean that won't change uh, as we learn more. On the first uh, question, you know, I don't think we've got around to getting all the data, but, you know, we can share some anecdotes and uh, so on. At least I haven't seen the quantitative profile data which we normally get yet on the 15,000. Vijay, you want to come in? And then I can add as well some anecdotes. Thanks. Um, Rajesh, not uh, comprehensive All India data, but I can give a feel of even a percentage, but from the data that I've seen, almost uh, close to 15% is a very new profile of buyer. 
uh, and it's very interesting to see that a lot of people in tech cities like Hyderabad, Bangalore, like I was talking to all our Andhra, Telangana, Hyderabad dealers yesterday, Bangalore, Pune, Mumbai, uh, uh, Gurgaon, in a lot of these places which are, you know, the ch where the larger chunks of booking have come from, it's very interesting to see that a lot of the, the young people want to buy this as their only and first vehicle. And that's also one of the reasons why, you know, we were talking about as a category when people are taking decisions to buy EVs, the process of buying is a little different. They want to drive the vehicle a couple of times. They want to be really convinced about the decision because they are looking at this as their primary vehicle. I think there's a fundamental shift where people bought EVs as a second or third vehicle in the family for local travel in short radiuses. Now people want to buy it as a mainstay product. So this is a very interesting insight that we are picking up that the profile of people who are considering applications are going to be different. Um, and a lot of them, as I said, uh, because we've not had a similar kind of product in the portfolio, uh, there are a lot of them are new people who are experiencing and considering Mahindra as a brand. If you want to add anything else. Yeah, to I, would, I would basically think there will be two sets of people who will come in. One is what Vijay described, which is uh, predetermined movement primarily. Uh, so, you know, you live in a tech city, your office is not that far away, you hence have to charge a couple of times a week. So, it's a predetermined uh, work to home usage, uh, I think doctors will fall in that category, a lot of them, because, you know, they, they know the hospitals they have to go to, where they visit. It's a very predetermined radius of movement, so there's a lot of predictability. Uh, so I think that will be one group of people. Uh, the second will be those who, uh, you know, are multi-car households, hence not worried, of, worried about range anxiety, and then want to add one electric option, uh, which just build which, which they can use flexibly. And I think we're going to get both, and I think we are getting both. Uh, so, but we'll just wait to put the data together. But it'll, it'll really be either this or that, and they're very different, very, very different customers, really. Uh, and just lastly, I will not ask you for the auto margin guidance, but uh, generally, what are the margin tailwinds and headwinds that you see from here on? You know, any, any uh, <laughs> as I just tried to explain to Manoj as well, that any time cost goes up is never good for margin. Uh, for any reason, because it becomes that much harder to pass margin on cost, and when we're looking at margin as a percentage, uh, in an inflationary setup, margins are never easy, right? unless you start getting a huge operating leverage, but uh, inflation is not good for margin. Deflation is much better for margin, because you, you, you never will pass on as quickly as the market is dropping. It's not even physically possible, because then You'll create a mess of all holding inventory, so on and so forth. Right? So you will never pass on uh, costs when they're dropping in pricing as quickly. So your margins inflate at that point of time. So when you think about margin, that's the reason I'm not comfortable right now because we need to see what everybody else is doing on the BS 6.2. We need to see how much headroom there is. Uh, it seems that there will be headroom, but that doesn't mean we should jump in and you know milk the uh, proverbial... Uh, cow as they call it, uh, just because uh, the, everybody is going to give us headroom, should we lose our sweet spot or is it an opportunity to strengthen ourselves? These are calls that we'll take, right, in terms of growth momentum versus margin. But uh, right now the reason we don't want to say anything is we want to see what everybody is doing on BS 6.2. Few people have put out their costs. They had already said their costs were going to be high and that's reflecting in the way they have taken the kind of price increase. But we need to see the couple of our mainstream competitors, what they're going to do and what kind of cost they pass on over the next, and nobody's doing it one shot. So people are going to take one increase now, one in April, one in uh, maybe a little later. So I, I, I would just wait to settle that to see how how much headroom there is. But we should not forget that we've seen almost commodity inflation of 18, 20%. Uh, we've seen the BS6 transition not that long back, two and a half, three years. So the BS6 cost, the inflation in the commodities, other regulations have put a huge amount of inflationary pressure in the category. To add margin every time you've got such a huge increase in cost uh, is not going to be easy. And that's what is impacting percentage margins. So, you know, I would, I, both for tractors and auto, you know, my advice is look at per unit right now. That's a much better representation of how the business is doing rather than percentage. Uh, just to add, two tailwinds 
our operating leverage <coughs> as a capacity goes up, our sales goes up, uh, and second, very tight cost control. Uh, and then the wild card, whether it's a headwind or tailwind, is commodities. We know all the different pressures of pluses and minuses on commodities. We don't know which way it's going to head in right now. Depends on China. Depends on inflationary pressure around the world. Will there be a recession or bigger recession around the world? Uh, that is actually good for commodity prices. So in some ways, the right answer to your question is a strong global recession is great tailwind for margins for auto business. Uh, right. So that, those are some of the facts. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, Raghu here from MK, and uh, congratulations on uh, very strong numbers, both on the top line as well as on the margins. Uh, sir, firstly, on the farm implement side, the business has been running in a certain way over the last few decades with unorganized uh, dominating the space, and now you are seeing organized taking share, and 40% growth is commendable. So, so if you can elaborate a bit on how you are achieving that in terms of adding new spaces, which all segments or products you are covering, and how that entire uh, you know farm implement space itself is evolving, and how you see you know like uh, making a better uh, cost of ownership kind of a uh, you know making it attractive for the farmers to you know adopt the organized players. Yeah. Uh, then, Hemant, you can pitch in after I finish if you want. Uh, so, when you think about the farm machinery space, uh, break it up first into what we call tractor attachments and tractor implements. So, rotavator would be in that category. Uh, and then, what is called self propelled. So, let's say harvester, rice transplanter, so on and so forth. That's the uh, first level of broad classification. Starting point of problem definition for us is we don't have our representative market share even in tractor implements, right? So even tractor implements like Rotovator, like, you know, we've spoken about the fact that we've gained a fair amount of share, but if our tractor market share is 40%, our Rotovator market share is only, let's say, 18, 20%, right? So there's an upside for us to make sure that we get uh, all tractor implements at close to tractor market share, right? So that's something that we have to believe is our right to win. Uh, so that's the first upside that's available in the business. Rotovator is a big category, uh, and that's the first area of focus that's, you know, we don't need category growth. There it's pure market share play. Uh, the harvester category is not a tractor implement. Uh, it's a, it's a self-propelled category. We have less than 10% market share there. Uh, we've done a lot with our product there. We play through Swaraj. Uh, here now we're going to be investing in, you know, strengthening uh, ex with an exclusive team that Swaraj will have to sell harvesters and multiple other action service capabilities, so on and so forth. Uh, there's no reason why we should not significantly improve our market share in harvesters with a good product. So there's one part of this which is really to say where are we suboptimal by way of market share even in the organized category today, right? So if you look at, uh, let's say, 450's YTD uh, odd uh, revenue and you do a annualized of that and so we're saying okay whatever 600 or uh, CR 600 plus CR will be uh, that is in an organized market of about 8,000 crores plus right so we are way below on market share uh, over and above the ability to grow the category so we believe the category will grow but we have a big upside by way of market share so while so we're going to work on both the fronts so one is how do we grow category uh, you know, we've often spoken about products like rice transplanters. I, I think the market size in India is still like maybe eight, four, five thousand a year, not even that. Less than that. Less than that. Uh, China, which is a sm smaller paddy growing country than India, sells over 100,000 rice transplanters a year. Uh, so, you know, many of these categories are going to have a big upside. Uh, there's very little farm machines used in horticulture right now in India. Horticulture, as you know now, is a you know, bigger output than even uh, the grain production. Uh, but there's not enough mechanization that's happened there. Uh, the many of products that we're looking in the horticulture space, which will help drive mechanization. 
So there are multiple things. That's why you know I didn't elaborate that in the presentation. But we've got products which are looking at each of these. Uh, the way we do category creating or pioneering products, as we internally call them, we need a different channel approach than what we're doing for you know the mainstream tractor uh, implement-driven products. So, you know, I had all of these comments on the slide, but I didn't build on it. But really, each of those bullet points has a very deep action plan. I'm just going to add to that. Uh, we don't look at 40% growth in this place as commendable. We go back to the comment on being tolerant. Yeah, We're not very tolerant on, on this right now. What we will commend the team for is that they've actually got a very strong vision now. 10x by 27 is very clear. A lot of good actions have been taken to start growing this business. Uh, products was a key part. We started with a 6% market share in this place. Right? Now we've got to go from 6 to 40. That should be our first right to be able to do that. Uh, but it's not just products, it's distribution, uh, it's the ability to understand what the customer wants, uh, it's innovation in certain areas, so it's a combination of all of those things. So the team has actually done a, a very nice job of, of driving that, um, and that is what will get us to the 10x, but ideally we want to see 60-70% annual growth in this space. Uh, and all of these investments are essential right now, and which is why my comment earlier that we're not focused on margins in this space at this point, because if we can get to a 10x by 27, margins will come after that. All of these investments will cause that margin, but we will have such a strong space because this is not a space where you've got many organized players. Uh, we've had our dealers selling everyone else's farm implements. Okay. Today we probably have three or four dealers selling other farm implements, and that too, ones where we know that we don't want to make those implements because they are very specific implements in certain for certain categories, which doesn't make sense for us to make. Uh, so all of that work has been done as well. So that's what will put us on the path for for the growth there. Thank you, sir. Uh, my second question, uh, I mean, we've been doing very well on the domestic side. FI23 has been a very strong growth, and 24, again, should continue with growth, though maybe slightly lower than 23. Uh, on the export side, how are you looking at the opportunity, how things will start playing out there? Currently, things are on the weaker side. I mean, just your thoughts on the efforts and how you see that market. Thank you. Um, yeah, exports is a space you'll watch for two, three reasons. Firstly, on the auto side, uh, you know, we've done the new launches of the Escopio and 700 in some of our countries, South Africa, which they've got a very good response. We started selling XUV uh, 300 as well. We've opened it up. Uh, in a few countries we weren't in earlier. So that's a positive side to the auto story. That being said, we are seeing a downturn because of Sri Lanka's and some of our neighboring countries are going through a really huge uh, economic challenge as a country. Uh, so that, and we do have a strong presence in the neighboring countries, both in tractors and auto. So when you look at exports, you'll have to break it up into, you know, where are you in one part of the world versus the region South Africa where the two markets, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, are badly impacted, very badly impacted. We see Bangladesh coming back a little quicker than Sri Lanka. Uh, we are right now not able to see when Sri Lanka will really revive. That when we have strong presence with all our products, both tractor and auto in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, both very, very big markets for us. So in, in, in I think till neighboring countries open up, it is going to have a base effect uh, you know, where the business in these countries is really low at the moment. So you would see a growth percentage impact, even though we're doing things in other parts of the world, but there you're going to see the effect of what's happening in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, the numbers. Okay. Um, thank you. I think uh, we have crossed the time limit already. Thanks a lot. I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to ask your questions. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and I request you to join us for a tea and XUV400 test drives. Thank you, Anish, Rajesh, and Manoj, and the entire leadership team for being here today. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And if we haven't answered anyone's questions or you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to send them in. We'll make sure that uh, we get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you. If you're test driving the 400, please be careful in the fearless mode. It really is super fast. <laughs>